Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Joe Scavato. I hope you had a great and safe Christmas as we got to celebrate the birth of our Savior. And somehow, as hard as this may be to believe, we are just about to the end of the year 2020. We're almost there. And like many of you, I am ready for a new year and a fresh start. But as I look back and remember this year, one of the bright spots for me has been getting able to spend more time with my wife, Judy, as we both have been working from home. It's been great, most of the time. But we've also learned a lot about each other and about married life. Like, for example, we've learned that it's possible to watch so much TV and movies that you just sit there scrolling and scrolling, looking for something to watch until you look at the clock and it's time to go to sleep. We've learned that a trip to the store can be considered big weekend plans. Ooh, very exciting. We've learned that it's possible to spend so much time together that you start arguing about how loudly each other chews their food. I've learned that it's possible for some people to use a pandemic as an excuse to put up Christmas decorations in early November. You all know who you are. Most of all, though, we've learned that life can just be really, really hard sometimes, especially when you feel stuck. This whole month as we've been approaching Christmas, we've been in this Advent series, Home for Christmas. And if you've been following along with us, you might remember we have been talking about being far from home, about longing from home, about being, about returning home, and then finally being welcomed home. And and that leads me to the topic I want to share with you all today, being stuck at home. Now, you can imagine being stuck at home, right? Maybe today you're sitting at home and you have your own list of things that you've learned and and lessons that you have experienced. And I know for a lot of us, it's really easy right now to feel stuck. Like we're just in this period of life and and there's nothing that we can do to get out and we don't know when it's going to end. And, And for many of us, when we feel stuck, it's really easy to face this temptation. To just want to kind of move on and and turn the page and close the door. Just look ahead to what's next. I even found this online. You can get this t-shirt that can help you kind of pretend that 2020 never happened. But today, as we close out this year, as we close out 2020, I want to spend some time talking about something that, that I think is maybe a little more difficult, but far, far better. Today, we're going to be going to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. I know you weren't expecting that right after Christmas, were you? But, but I believe that there is a message that many of us, myself included, need to hear today. And it's summarized in just one word. Remember. Before you move ahead, before you look to what's next, we have an opportunity right now that I believe can help us from, from getting stuck or staying stuck in our lives and in our faith. And it starts with remembering. So I'm going to read to you the, uh, the first five verses of Deuteronomy chapter 8. And this is Moses speaking to the nation of Israel. He says this, Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, So the Lord your God disciplines you. So there are a few things that I want to share with you today as we talk about remembering. And as we examine these verses, the first thing I want to explore is remembering God's principles. When I look back at this year, one of the things that's really hard to believe is how quickly we've adjusted and become familiar to this new way of life. Everything from the things that we do to even the terms that we use. This may just be me, I don't, I don't know about you, but, but I was not familiar with the term socially distant before this year. I had never celebrated in a store because they were in stock with toilet paper or hand sanitizer. But we adjust. We become familiar. We, we've had to become familiar with these rules that have been given to us when we go out in public too, haven't we? You know what I'm talking about. You, you've seen and, and heard these, it seems, anytime you go anywhere. 
wear a mask, keep socially distant, and wash your hands. Now, however you feel about these, whether you love them or hate them, it seems like they've kind of become ingrained in our minds, the three COVID commandments. Now, back in, in the spring, back in like April, I was so good at this stuff. I had masks everywhere. I had one in my car. I had one in my wife's car. I, had, I, I hid one in her purse like I was covered. My hands were getting dry from washing them all the time. And, and then over time, though, I started to realize and, and had to catch myself from starting to drift away from these COVID commandments. I can't tell you how many times I was going to a store or somewhere and had to turn around because I forgot my mask. I no longer sing the alphabet out loud when I wash my hands. Remember when we did that? We drift. And I think it's part of this natural tendency that we as human beings have. And if you're a parent or or a teacher, you can probably attest to this as well. That we have this tendency to, to drift away from and forget what we have been told. It's true not just when it comes to public health rules, but in every part of our lives. Moses is speaking to that drift as well. Let me read for you verses 1 and 3 of Deuteronomy 8 again. Verse 1, he says this, Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Then we'll skip to verse 3. It says this, He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Be careful to follow every command. Now again, this is Moses speaking to the nation of Israel, and they're actually some of the last words that he gives before his death and before the Israelites entered into the promised land. So this came after their time in Egypt as slaves and after the rescue out of that slavery and and even after the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. During this time, this pattern started to emerge that Moses was speaking about. There was this pattern where where God would rescue his people and he would show them grace and mercy. And then after some time, it it seemed like the Israelites started to drift away from what they had been told. To forget the commands, to forget that God was leading them. And they would disobey God and it would lead to complaining and rebellion and one time even making their own idol to worship. And Moses would intercede on their behalf and and God would agree to continue to show them grace and mercy. So it's the cycle of grace and mercy, disobedience and drifting, followed by grace and mercy again. In other words, it's the same cycle that you and I as Christ followers continue to be on today. A reminder for us of our need that we have for Jesus to intercede on our behalf. So this section of Deuteronomy, Moses is just reciting the law that God had given to them. And he's telling them, don't drift from this. Don't forget these commands. Remember these principles and and stay grounded in these things that God has given you. And he will give you life and increase and promise. So the question for us then is this. Okay, so, so remember the commands. What does that mean for me? What does that look like in my life? If you, if you had to summarize that, what would that be? Well, in Matthew 22, someone asked Jesus a remarkably similar question. Matthew 22, verse 36, Jesus has asked this question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replies, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So what does it look like for you to remember and keep God's commands and to keep his principles grounded in your life? It looks like loving God and loving your neighbor. This is our anchor. This is the aim of our lives to grow in these ways. And I wonder for you, and and I've wondered this for myself as well, in a year that's been filled with challenge and difficulty, if we've had to catch ourselves from drifting away from what we have been told. If it's been hard for you to remember to love God and love your neighbor. The example that we see from the Israelites is that this is always a challenge, but especially so when it feels like we're lost or wandering or stuck. 
when it's so much easier to just complain or rebel or to just look out for ourselves. But Moses is saying, don't drift away. Don't forget what matters most. Remember these commands. Look at verse 3 with me. It says that we don't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. This line may sound familiar to some of you as the words of Jesus. In Matthew 4, verse 4, Jesus says this exact thing. He he answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. This was Jesus' response to the devil when he was being tempted after spending 40 days in his own wilderness. A clear parallel for us to our story and what the Israelites had just experienced. And he quotes this verse from Deuteronomy, and in doing so, he gives us an example of what should have happened. He gives us an example of what it looks like to remember God's word. He's saying, don't drift towards a self-centered life. Don't drift towards temptation. Don't drift towards making an idol out of the things of this world, including your own self-interest. Remember what matters most. Remember my principles. That leads us to our second remembrance, remembering God's presence. Judy and I have been married for five years now, and during that time, we both have gotten to know each other's families more and more, but I remember the first holiday I spent with her family. We were just dating at the time, and we were going to their Thanksgiving dinner, and I was so nervous. I remember as we were on the way, I told her something like, you know, whatever happens, just Like, don't leave me alone. Like, let's just stay together and and I need the moral support and I need the help. I don't want to do or say the wrong thing. And sure enough, after a few minutes of us walking through the door, she was recruited into the kitchen to help prepare the meal. And I was led to another room to to do something else with everybody that wasn't uh, in the kitchen. And I felt like I was a deer in the headlights that had also been thrown into the deep end. Like I was a mess. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. Uh, What are the ground rules here? I I was just so nervous. And I don't remember saying anything too embarrassing, although they might have a different memory of that day. But, But what I do remember is this feeling of relief that I felt when we were reunited after this great separation of like an hour probably. Because I knew that even if I did or said the wrong thing, as long as she was there, as long as she was present, then that would be enough for me to get by. Being present matters, doesn't it? We've all had people that make us feel more or less comfortable, more or less like ourselves. And Moses understood the importance of presence too. Let me read for you verse 2 in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. So I want to focus on that phrase, the Lord your God led you, but quickly let me address the rest of this verse because maybe some of you are thinking as you read this verse or look at this passage that that God doesn't seem very kind, does he? I mean, Moses says God tested you, he humbled you. Later in verse 5, he disciplined you, and it almost gives us this image of this kind of mean and angry and vengeful sort of God. But this is where Remembering the context of what we're reading is so important. Remember that cycle of sin that we talked about earlier, of of grace and mercy, followed by disobedience and drifting and, and grace and mercy again. When Moses is speaking here, this is after that had been going on for years and years. And so when he says that God is testing the Israelites, it's not like God is saying, you know, I'm going to try to get these people to to mess up. I'm going to see if they're good enough. No, God is saying, you've already messed up. And I'm going to give you one opportunity after another to come back to me, to return home. Here's an opportunity to turn from your sin. Here's a chance to stop worshiping idols. Here's a chance to be humble because I am God. And you are not. It's like if you've ever not done well in a class and your teacher gave you an opportunity to make up some of your work. This isn't God being mean. This is God showing mercy. So verse 2 says that that God led you all the way in the wilderness. And that phrase, led you, also translates to walk with. So Moses here is saying, remember God's presence. Remember how he walked with you every step of the way. 
even in your wandering. Remember how he provided you a a pillar of fire to guide your path. Remember how he provided you manna to feed you. Remember how he gave you clothes that did not wear out. Remember how he even kept your feet from swelling. Remember how he thought of everything. Remember his faithfulness, even in the wilderness. What a perfect message as we approach the end of this year for the church to hear today. What a perfect message for you if you feel stuck in your life or stuck in your faith. That when those times come along, and they do for all of us, that one of the greatest and most important things we can do is to remember God's presence and faithfulness in our lives. To remember that he has been walking with you every step of the way. To look at the example of the Israelites and and see that just as he did not abandon them, there is nothing that can make him abandon you. He is still present. He is still working. And here's the truth of this passage, that as much as we all have lost something this year, and, and we all have, haven't we? That if he has given you his presence, he has given you enough. If he has given you his presence, he has given you enough. And we just celebrated this at Christmas, how the word became becoming flesh to dwell among us, to be present among us. So ask yourself this. As hard as things have been, and as many challenges as you have faced this year, and I don't want to minimize that at all because we know those things are real. But as hard as those things have been, where have I seen God show up in my life? Where have I seen his faithfulness? Remember his presence. That brings us to the final thing we need to remember, which is remembering God's promises. Look again with me back to verse 1. We talked about the first part of that verse, about following the commands and the word, but, but look to the end of this verse. So that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Now, this oath is something that everyone that Moses was speaking to would be very familiar with. It goes all the way back to the book of Genesis and and this covenant that God made with Abraham, that that he would bring them to this promised land and bring a great nation out of his descendants. And after all this time and and all of these obstacles that they had faced, all of this frustration and, and pain and sorrow, that they were this nation and they were about to enter into that promise. So that brings up a couple of things I want to make sure that we don't miss as we talk about God's promises. Number one, God's promises don't depend on our performance. That cycle of sin that Israel went through, that that we all go through, would have made it well within God's rights to say, you know what, the deal's off. You've lost this promise. But even when Israel strayed and, and drifted away from God, his faithfulness remained and still does to this day. So often we misunderstand this part of our faith and we we think that we have to earn God's love and perform in a certain way in order to be good enough. But the lesson here is that his grace and his mercy is freely offered to those who ask for it. God's promises don't depend on our performance. Then the second thing, God's promises come true according to his timing. This one's a little bit harder to deal with, at least for me. But again, think about this example we have of the Israelites. Think about all the obstacles they faced, how many times nothing went their way. Their time as slaves in Egypt and, and wandering in the desert. Think about how many moments there must have been where they said, you know what? This probably just isn't going to happen. This promise must not be coming true. But the story of this, this example and the story of the Bible shows us again and again that God's delays are not the same as his denial. God was not done working in them and his promise was still coming true. But he knew that there were things that they had to learn in the wilderness first. So when we talk about and pray about God's promises in our lives, prayers for his kingdom to come, prayers for wholeness and healing, we have to remember this truth. Let all of these things come true in his timing. And finally, God promises that no time in the wilderness is wasted. 
We see this, how, how he used the wilderness to grow and mature and humble his people. And, and again, we see this throughout the story of the Bible, how God has this amazing way to use and redeem the darkest and most difficult parts of our lives for growth and for good, to do something in us that we never otherwise would have experienced. Earlier, I talked about some of the learning experiences that Judy and I have gone through, the, the boredom, the, the big exciting plans, the fights about decorations. But the truth is this, that this has been the hardest year in the life of our family too. Back in March, back when the pandemic was really starting and, and things were just shutting down, my family had to say goodbye to my dad after a year and a half battle with ALS that just left our family completely broken. Many of you know this grief and, and this pain that accompanies that kind of loss. Grief that still feels fresh on many days to me. And so trust me when I tell you that if anyone wants that this year to just be forgotten and left alone, it would be me. But here's what I want to say to those of you today that, that have experienced a year that you just want to forget. If you've experienced the loss of a loved one, if you've experienced the loss of a job, if, if you're experiencing stress or anxiety or fears about your life or about the future, that as much as there's been behind us and as much pain as there might be in our present, as many unknowns as there are in the future, here's what we know to be true based on his word that God can and will bring redemption and growth even out of a year like this one into our lives. So don't waste your wilderness. Don't waste this waste of a year. Before you look ahead and move on and turn the page, take time to look back and remember. Remember all of the ways that God showed up in your life. And I want to encourage you today to, to write this down, to do this by yourself or as a family or with friends or your small group, but, but make a list to help you remember. Answer this question, what did God reveal to me about himself or who I am in him? Where did God show up? Where did I see his faithfulness? And remember this today, that his word is still true. His presence is still here and his promises remain. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your presence in our lives. Lord, we thank you for what you have done in us, even in a year that we never would have asked for. God, I pray right now for those of us that have experienced pain and loss and, and all sorts of other things that, that we never expected. I pray that you would show yourself to us now, that you would show us your faithfulness, that you would remind us of your word and the truth and the promises that are in it. God, we look forward to a new year, but, but let us learn the lesson that you wanted us to in this one. We love you so much and we pray this in your name. Amen.